the uh, September 4th uh, Sandag Transportation uh, Committee meeting. Um, could you all please rise and uh, join me in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance? Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Okay, next I want to, with our clerk, do we have a quorum today? Yes, Chair Desmond, you have a quorum for this meeting. Thank you, Tessa. Okay, I'd like to remember, uh, remind members of the public on our process for both member and public comments. The primary members will be using, use your cameras um, uh, and we'll be able to, to uh, take uh, live public comments today. Members are asked to turn on their cameras when they have a comment or a question and then I'll recognize you and um, uh, hopefully get you in, uh, <laughs> see, what, see, your, uh, see you're there. Uh, I'd also like to ask our legal counsel now to provide a quick reminder on how the public comments will work. Uh, Amber Lynn, can you do that please? Thank you, Supervisor Desmond. As noted on the cover page of today's meeting agenda, in addition to emailed comments, the public may also provide live comments during the meeting. To provide those live comments, you can join today's Zoom meeting through the link or by dialing one of the numbers from your phone that are provided on the cover page of the agenda. When public Comments are called for on an item. On the Zoom platform, click on the raised hand icon on the toolbar on the top right of the screen, and the chair will call on you by the name you have provided. If you please press star nine, which will raise your hand to indicate your desire to speak. The chair will call on you by the last three digits of your telephone number. The instructions pro for providing live comments are also on the bottom of the cover page of today's agenda, which can be accessed from the homepage of Sandeg's website. All comments, whether they are emailed or live, will be made part of today's meeting record. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you, Amberlynn. Um, and I think, Tess, I'm gonna have you call on the names of the telephone numbers and things like that, since I don't know if I can even see them, but uh, I'll have you do that. Um, if everybody's ready, we'll go ahead and we'll start with item one. This is approval of meeting minutes of July 17th. Um, there's one A, one B, and one C. Uh, of, um, there's July 17th meeting. There was a joint meeting uh, between the Regional Border and Borders Committee with the Transportation. Then on August 7th, there was also a joint meeting uh, with the, with the um, three uh, committees as well. So is there a motion? I move approval. Second from Sankey. All right, we got a motion by Feller, second by Sankey. Any discussion? If you call the roll, please. Thank you. On item number one, San Diego County Regional Airport Authority, Joanna Schiavone. Schiavone, yes. City of San Diego, Council Member Monica Montgomery. Yes. County of San Diego, Chair Jim Desmond. Yes. East County, Council Member Bill Baber. Yes. Um, MTS, I do not see either Mayor Sotelo Solis or Council Member Ron Hall, so they will be marked as absent. North County Coastal, Mayor Jewel Edson. And Mayor Edson, if you could text me your vote, I understand you're having some technical issues. Um, I see that you're on, or I could tell him on Council Member Joe Mosca and he could vote. Joe Mosca, yes, uh, representing North County Coastal. Thank you. North County Inland, Mayor Paul McNamara. McNamara, yes. North County Transit District, Deputy Mayor Jack Feller. Feller, yes. Port of San Diego, Council Member Gary Benelli. Benelli, uh, yes. Please. Commissioner, Commissioner Benelli. Commissioner Benelli, yes. And South County, Vice Chair Bill Sankey. Sankey, yes. Thank you. That item passes unanimously with those members present. All right, thank you very much, uh, Tessa. Um, moving on to public comments or communications, member comments. Um, Tessa, do we have any uh, 
um, unagendized um, public comments. Thank you, Chair. I do not see any hands raised at this time. Okay, how about any member comments? Turn on your video if you, uh, if you have a comment under public comments, not agendized today. I don't see anybody. Um, okay, well, moving on to the executive director's report. Uh, Mr. Akrata. Hey, good morning, Mr. Chairman. It's Ray Trainer, your uh, chief deputy filling in today for Hassan. Okay. Uh, so just three brief updates uh, this morning. Um, first of all, introduce to everybody on the committee uh, your new clerk, which is Francesca Webb. So starting next week, uh, Francesca is going to be the clerk of the board. Um, but before I get into Francesca, just wanted to recognize um, Tessa Lero. So Tessa, who has been your clerk for so many years and done a really amazing job uh, working on all the board work, all the policy advisory committees, she's been making sure everything runs smooth for you, um, has now moved on to another role within SANDAG and she'll be serving as the executive assistant to uh, your executive director. So uh, Francesca, if you can come on the camera just for a second, just wanted to see, let the, the, the staff and the folks see you this morning. So just for all of you, Francesca, you may have seen her. She's been with Sandag for a number of years working in our editorial branch. And she's been just like an expert helping us um, get all the agendas produced for uh, meetings like the Transportation Committee. Uh, but for a long time, Francesca has been interested in serving as the clerk. And so when we had this opportunity for uh, this, uh, this new position, uh, Francesca was uh, the, the one who was selected for that. So we're quite confident in Francesca and her background. So Francesca, welcome. We'll see you uh, next TC when you're fully in the role. Um, but uh, for those of you that not met her, looking forward to that day when we can all be face to face and you get a chance to see her up close and personal. So thanks. And we see her with her uh, mask off. Sure. Uh -oh. <laughs> Let me social distance so she can. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Well, Francesca, uh, I'm, I'm going to apologize early if I call you Tessa. Um, future meetings. <laughs> That's quite all right. <laughs> okay, Rick. Jessica, so yeah, thank you, sir. Um, uh, one thing that uh, I wanted to just mention is we've received a lot of uh, public comment this week on the, uh, the Rancho Lilac um, property, which you might recall came up at a board meeting back in May. So just want to let you know that staff are continuing to work with Caltrans and members of the community. Uh, this project really is part of uh, our land uh, management work under the Environmental Mitigation Program, which you're going to hear from Kim Smith this morning. She's going to talk about that program. Uh, and while she's not going to talk about the Rancho Lilac property, we just wanted you to be aware that we're continuing to coordinate with the community uh, to make sure that we can protect all the environmental and historic resources on the property. And at the same time, not preclude any public access, because we know that that was a, a big question that was raised back in May. So you'll see this, Mr. Chairman and the members of the uh, board will, will see this uh, most likely at your September 25th meeting. So that's not, is that going to transportation first or just going right to the board? Well, it'll come to the board. It was brought to the board um, last time. And so it's really coming uh, for some action around a contract approval. That was the main thing that the board has the, uh, the, uh, the delegation to approve the contract. So that was really what we're going to be bringing back to you in, in September. Okay, but that goes to the board, not to the TC. Okay, yeah. thank you. And then last thing, just some really good news. So you might recall with the, the Assembly Bill 2731, that's the CEQA streamlining legislation. So we're really pleased that this now has passed unanimously out of both houses up in Sacramento. So it's awaiting the governor's signature. Um, and the governor has until the end of this month to sign that bill. So that's a, a real good thing for us and uh, helping to solve some of the airport connectivity um, issues that the regions face for all these years. So, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report, and thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions for uh, Ray on the report? From staff, anybody? Okay. Um, welcome, Francesca. We look forward to working with you uh, throughout our, our meetings here. So, welcome aboard. Okay. Chair uh, yeah. Desmond, we need to ask for public comment on okay. item three. Do you have any public comment on item three? 
Do we? I do not see any hands raised at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, we're going to move on to item four. Well, actually, the consent, uh, consent items, this is four, five, and six. Item four is to approve new membership appointments uh, to the Social Services Transportation Advisory Council. The other two items are quarterly updates, uh, one on the transportation grant program and the other one on the mitigation and land grant management program. Is there um, uh, anyone, any items any members would like to pull or have a presentation on or have questions on? Do we have any public comment on any of these uh, three items on consent, uh, Tessa or Francesca? Thank you, Chair. I do not see any hands raised on the consent agenda. Uh, do we have a motion to uh, for the consent agenda? I move approval. Move. Mayor Sotelo Solis on consent agenda. Okay, so we got Mayor Sotelo Solis uh, making a motion, and then I think I heard a second from Mr. Feller. So, um, do we have a roll call vote, please? Primarily on item four, which is an approval item. Yes, sir. So on the consent agenda, San Diego County Regional Airport Authority, Joanna Schiavone. Schiavone, yes. City of San Diego, Council Member Monica Montgomery. Yes. County of San Diego, Chair Jim Desmond. Yes. East County, Council Member Bill Baber. Yes. Metropolitan Transit System, Mayor Alejandro Sotelo Solis. Sotelo Solis, aye. Uh, North County Coastal, Mayor Jewel Edson. Edson, Mayor Edson, if you could please text me your vote. I know that you're present and, and I'll move on and come back and announce your vote. North County Inland, Mayor Paul McNamara. McNamara, yes. North County Transit District, Deputy Mayor Jack Feller. Feller, yes. Port of San Diego, Commissioner Gary Benelli. Benelli, yes. But South County, Vice Chair Bill Sankey. Sankey, yes. And for the record, I would like to indicate that North County Coastal Mayor Jewel Edson's vote on this item is yes. That item passes unanimously. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on to reports. Our first report is item seven, update of transportation projects. These are projects that I asked at the last uh, meet, the August meeting that we get an update on, um, I guess, six of them. So if we get, we have a presentation by Elisa Arias um, from Sandeg. Good morning, Chair Desmond, Vice Chair Sankey, members of the committee. As Chair Desmond mentioned at the Transportation Committee meeting on July 17th, the committee approved the release of Amendment 14 of the 2018 Regional Transportation Improvement Program, or RTIP, and this was released for public comment. And the next agenda item actually is also related to the RTIP item. At the July meeting, the committee also requested additional information on six out of the 260 projects that are included in Amendment 14. And this information is included in Attachment 1 of the staff report. Next. So in the description of, this, of these projects, we use a few terms related to managed lanes that I would like to go over. We describe different types of managed lanes. So for example, HOV or carpool lanes, these are lanes that provide access to carpools, van pools, transit, motorcycles, emergency vehicles, and also some linear vehicles with the appropriate decals. And examples in our region are I-805 in South County, 805 between 52 and the Merge, and also I-5 between the Merge and Solana Beach. Express lanes basically provide access to the same types of vehicles at no cost. That is transit, carpools, van pools, motorcycles, emergency vehicles, and clean air vehicles. But the difference is that excess capacity on the express lanes is available for people driving alone to travel for a fee using the fast track system. Think of the I-15 express lanes. 
And then finally, transit priority lanes are only open to transit vehicles, and they accommodate both regional and local bus routes. In our region, we have transit lanes on State Route 15 between 805 and Interstate 8. How different types of managed lanes continue to be implemented in the future will likely vary based on the specific conditions or circumstances for each corridor. Now, going back to the projects from ARTIPA Member 14, for which more information was requested, they include the I-5 and I-805 conversion of HOV lanes to express lanes and the I-15 transit priority lanes. These two projects were added to the ARTIPA Member 14 for the first time to reflect the funding that the board allocated in the standard FY21 budget that was approved in June of this year. And funding for these projects doesn't start until fiscal year 2024. Including these two projects in the RTIP amendment basically aligns the FY21 budget and the RTIP and makes both documents consistent. In addition, the other projects that are described in attachment one are improvements to state routes 52, 67, 78, and the central mobility station. And these projects uh, are, are being evaluated or will be evaluated in the comprehensive multimodal corridor plans or CMCPs that are currently underway. And later in, at this meeting, Colleen Clemens and Alan Kossop will present uh, on CMCPs with a focus on the North County Regional Corridor. This concludes the presentation, and project managers from Caltrans and Sandag are available to, an to answer any questions from the committee on the projects in this item. Thanks for your attention. Well, I got to tell you, I'm disappointed. I thought you were going to go through each each project that uh, and explain and give the explanations for them, <clears throat> but apparently that's not part of your presentation today. Um, I guess I should have been clearer. Is there any questions of any of the member committees on this item? Committee members, I guess. Uh, yeah, uh, this is uh, Paul McMurray. I have one question. So are we going to get into a brief with more detail or what, or is this it? We have the project managers from each of the projects and they're available for any questions or a brief presentation. Uh, if they have presentations on these projects, I'd, I'd like to see them. That was the original intent. All right, we have some, um, do you, uh, can, can you move to the next slide? The, the next project is, the, um, we have a map here for the I-5, 805 conversion of HOV lane. Alan Kossop, thank you. Good morning, uh, I'm Alan Kossop, North Coast Corridor Director. Um, the project for I-5 and 805, um, as you know, we already have existing carpool lanes on the south end of the corridor. Uh, we're in the middle of constructing additional carpool lane, HOV carpool lanes, and so, uh, by the end of 22, 2022, we'll have carpool lanes from 805.52 all the way up to 78. Um, the project in question would convert those uh, existing lanes, the, convert the, the new carpool lanes to express lanes, just like we have on I-15. So that we'd be using the express lane model. Um, and then the studies would begin in uh, when the money becomes available in 24. Uh, it would roughly take about two years to design and to develop the rules, the software that goes with it. Did the board vote on, those, on making those uh, lanes, um, express lanes from HOV lanes? The uh, express lanes were included in the environmental document, the original environmental document, and it has been a historic part of the RTP. But did the board vote to change them from, to express lanes? Well, the, the item, this item in September of last year was the project that partially funded that effort. So yes, the board voted. Okay, thank you. But, but I would say that uh, as we move through the process, we'll bring back the project to have continuing collaboration on what the project looks like. Okay. Kendall, can you move to the next slide, please? Hi, Chair. Chair Desmond, I just had one quick question for you. Sure, who's this? 
Who's this? This is Mayor Sotelo Solis. Who's this? Hey, this what? Is number. Who's this? Well, you um, gotta you gotta give me your name because it, it, as soon as <laughs> hi there. No, uh, well, I have my camera on. I have my camera on. Hi oh, there. Sorry. Uh, I yeah. don't see it. Okay, sorry. We gotta go gallery view. Uh, so real quick, um, just with regards to your question, I, I guess I'm I'm curious. Are are is that one of the things that you wanted uh, clarification on from staff? Whether or not we as a board have um, uh, have passed or approved of these changes or just so I can have clarification what what you're gonna what you're asking so then I can know that the question has been asked and I can follow up if it's not being asked um, I, I guess I don't understand your question I, I asked Are for you ask clarifications because when we had the our tip that came before us it just had one line descriptions of all these projects so okay. I asked for a clarification and a presentation on those six of those projects and that's what oh. we're doing here so that's um and so that's the whole reason we, they're here and then i don't know i had the question of on that one when i heard that, that change had taken place uh, if if we had voted on that change that's yeah i guess uh, it also too it would be uh interesting to to hear if that is part of your your line of questioning whether or not all six projects have been voted on um because if it's not asked, I, I, I would appreciate knowing as well. Okay. That's, I just right. I just wanted to, to, to let you know. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Alan, you want to go ahead and get the next one? And Mayor uh, Edson has her camera up. Karen Jewell will present on the I-15 transit lanes project. Well, does Mayor Edson have a question? I do. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, great. Um, so are we still on I-5? Because I've been fighting to get connectivity. Sorry, I'm on my laptop versus my real screen and stuff. Um, we still on I-5? Sure. If you got a question, go ahead. OK. Um, so I understood from attachment one and the staff report that there's dynamic pricing. Um, so I kind of have a couple of questions. Uh, are commercial vehicles and um, in other words, semi trucks allowed to participate in uh, in the fast track? Yes. Yes, they are. Is that the answer? Okay, yes. thanks. Um, and it, it talks about certain types of cleaner vehicles. Can you define what those are? Um, so the state has various restrictions based on um, uh, miles per gallon. Uh, most of these are going to be high elect EV vehicles. How's that? Okay, that's good for me. Um, and a little bit of clarification. So it, it mentions that by summer 2020, three, the conversion schedule to begin there. Do I understand correctly that there will be two lanes in each direction at that time and only one of the HOV lanes will be converted to uh, the fast track. So the existing project only uh, convert uh, only builds one additional lane and the project that you're funding only converts that one new lane to an express lane uh, model. So okay, it would only so be one lane in each direction would be express. Okay, so there will be no regular HOV lane on I-5 from Solana Beach North or, or the lower strut? It would be from 52 to 78. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. On the I-15 project, Karen Jewell, please. Good morning. Um, so the I-15 project is from Interstate 8 to 52. It would be to do transit priority lanes in the median with the potential DAR at the Claremont Mesa, half DAR, excuse me, at the Claremont Mesa interchange. This project is, um, is in, has, was preliminarily designed um, oh, over 10 years ago. So in the environmental document, when that moved forward, 
it would uh, analyze the, uh, the definition of those lanes and how they could be connected with anything in the areas. So if there's any questions. Okay, do we have a further presentation then on the I-15 lane, transit, transit lanes, transit priority lanes here? I would say they also are for support of the MTS bus routes that go up I-15 and connect with Claremont Mesa Boulevard. Okay. Is there any is there any other presentation on this I-15? If we could move to the 52, if not. Yes, we can move on to 52. I have the 52 as well. Okay. <clears throat> the new operational improvement project is slated to uh, to convert the existing bike path going in the westbound direction between Mass Boulevard and Santo Road to a travel lane and then relocate that bike path on the eastbound direction uh, on the south side of 52. It also would include potentially restriping the uh, bridge over the San Diego River uh, in two phases. One would be eastbound direction to three lanes and in the westbound direction to three lanes. Uh, the other conductivity there is, uh, there was originally uh, auxiliary lane between 15 and Santo that is now being included in a shop project and uh, but there will be ramp metering included at the Santo interchange is what is proposed right now. This project is in the environmental document right now and is, um, is privately funded. If there's any questions that completes my report on this project. A quick question, Mr. Chair. Sure. So there's an awful lot involved in this particular project that could be broken down into pieces. Um, will any of this happen sooner than other parts of it, particularly the, the, the harder construction parts of it? For example, the auxiliary, the auxiliary lane would make a big difference really soon. Moving the bike paths and things like that might be a little bit harder project, especially because you're adding a lane over at that side. Um, how's that How's the construction phase of this looking? I know you said it's an environmental right now. So the, uh, the reason that we removed this auxiliary lane out of that, the, the operational 52, was that the shop project is actually ahead of the uh, operational project that goes down to Santee. So that, that document is actually slated to finish this fall. And with that, it'll be moving into design sooner. So that's one of the reasons we split it out. Um, okay. The operational project is looking for spring for an environmental document right now. Okay, Karen. Thanks very much. Appreciate that. Jim, I have a question. Hello? Oh. Jim, you're muted. Jack, go ahead. Sorry. Thank you. Um, PowerPoint. You came, uh, I, I travel this road a lot. Uh, I'm a little concerned about the condition of the freeway with the dips. And is that have anything to do with uh, making this six lanes through there? Uh, because the, the dips that are, it seems like failing ground or something similar. Uh, so there, there is an, a current existing uh, emergency project that is repairing those dips. Uh, they started construction last week, oh. and uh, they should be completed in the next two months of uh, doing some uh, um, okay. uh, compacting <laughs> routing to try and, and get those to stabilize. Well, I haven't been uh, down there since the week before last week, so thank you. You're welcome. Then the do we have 
morning, Chair. This is Ross Cather with Caltrans. I'm the Design Division Chief here and also the Corridor Director. So let me go over where we are with the 67 project. And if you remember, this was programmed as part of the most recent RTIP amendment, RTIP 4, Amendment 4. Um, it's a very long corridor, 16 miles. So what we have done is divide this up into these six segments that are shown on the map. Each one of these segments has got unique demands, unique characteristics, and may have unique answers or solutions to them. So, so far where we are in the process, um, the environmental has started the actual notice of preparation we expect to issue in the fall, and we'll have the public scoping meeting at that time. Um, we're continuing with gathering all of the data on the project, um, the traffic volumes, future projections, particular collision data, um, starting outreach to some of the uh, agencies that have been involved in fire evacuation. Um, we've been doing or gathering the geographic mapping, and again, it's a very long corridor. It's quite complex. Um, the design groups are in the process of now laying out potential alternatives on top of that mapping so we can identify exactly what are the physical limits of the environmental impacts and so we know what studies or the scope of the studies as we go into that that uh, notice of preparation and public scoping in the fall um, we have started some community outreach on the project we have had one meeting with uh, ramona community planning group we recognize they are a very important stakeholder in the project we did um, it, it was a virtual meeting they're still meeting virtually um, the group the Ramona community planning group has set up a separate subcommittee specific to 67 and our project manager has been meeting with them uh, we've set up a regular routine of meeting with them and updating them on the project so if we that completes my report of where we're at. Again, we're very early in the environmental process, but um, I'm available for any questions. I got a, I have a question for you. <clears throat> in, the, in the narrative on this item on page six, um, where you're describing the, uh, the 67 improvements, <clears throat> the last sentence of the first paragraph, it says, it's important to note that the project is currently described as a four lane conventional highway However, alternatives addressing safety, operational, and, and environmental concerns are still to be developed and will be determined through the environmental process. So it sounds as if the four-lane road is potentially not going to happen. But is that, is that environmental process, is that also part of the corridor system management plan and study? Because I know we put $3 million towards each of these corridor plans. So yeah, the the, the corridor system management plan effort is in parallel to this. I know it is a little bit unusual that we would be doing an environmental document at the same time that we would be doing a, a CMCP, but we're trying to keep those in, in alignment as we move forward. And we will be making a presentation on that, that effort in October. But re regarding the alternative, you know, what was what was listed currently listed in the programming document, the four lane conventional highway, we will carry that alternative into environmental. Uh, the environmental process will drive what the final solution is, um, and w we will be looking at other solutions. You know, the the primary need of the project is, of course, uh, to address safety on the corridor, and then demand not only De regular demand, the conventional demand, commute demand, but also the demand during um, evacuation events. So we're going to come out of that with alternatives that meet that need and purpose for each one of those six segments. And as I said there, you know, I expect that each one of those six segments will have a unique solution. Okay. Do you have any other questions for this uh, on this item? Yeah, Jim, real quick. Sure. Ross, thank you very much. I'm glad you included those comments in your last bit of the narrative. Um, is there, I know it's maybe early, but is there an opportunity to provide all four of those lanes outbound in an emergency situation or, or at least add one more lane of capacity? I would hope that we'd think about 
um, going the wrong way on the one-way street when we need to get everybody out. Yeah, um, I, I think it's based on the feedback that we've received already from emergency service providers, it, it would be unlikely we'd ever want to get in a situation that we would provide all of the lanes outbound. Um, only because during these situations we have to get emergency service people into the area and it, it you know 67 is going to need to serve that purpose also so we are you know in a, and truthfully modeling for evacuation is something relatively new there is not a lot of research on it so we are trying to develop what's what the demand is during a fire event um, and the, and that's one of going to be one of the most important parts of this project and part of the environmental studies but we're looking at alternatives that essentially will provide evacuation capacity during those events whatever the demand is and then also provide some access into the community for emergency services during those same events thanks ross appreciate that thank you um all right 78 Alan, thank you. Yes, uh, later in the day we have a presentation on 78.15, so I'll uh, pass on that one so that we can go into more detail later in uh, item 10. Um, the item also, the RTIP item also added funds to begin the environmental document for the 78 express lanes that basically connect the two ends. So this is the beginning of the uh, environmental process this year. Um, and so we'll, uh, we'll work through public outreach, uh, developing a, a preliminary design. Um, it's a fairly long corridor, um, so we anticipate it's uh, probably a close to a five-year environmental process. Um, and then on the west end, uh, we would also look at improving the connectors there, right? We, uh, that's the location where we don't have one connector, uh, or we don't have the connectors to and from the south. Um, and so this project would add those or study alternatives to add those and to connect the express lane systems both on 78 and 5. Um, also, just the beginning of the environmental document there. Um, so we need to you know, have a robust outreach, uh, identify alternatives, um, and that's coming up in, I think, a year or two based on the funding availability would be the start of that phase. Well, of course, I have a question for you on the 78. Um, the, um, the narrative, uh, and, and even you mentioned express lanes, yet in item eight, and even in this item where it shows the, uh, narr the narrative here for the, the projects, it shows the RTIP language. The RTIP language says I-5 SR-78 HOV connectors. It all, and also for the, for the eight managed lanes are called out as HOV managed lanes. And the interchange of the I-5 and 78 is titled in the RTIP, SR-78 and I-5 HOV lanes. Now you're calling them express lanes. And in the beginning, in the very short presentation that Lisa gave us, uh, express lanes are, are different than HOV lanes. So the language between the narrative and what, was, what is in the actual RTIP is different. And I don't recall the board taking a vote to make these managed lane or express lanes on, on these connectors or the HOV lanes down the center. So I'll come back to this, but that's just a, something I want to point out is the language in item eight is different than the language in the narrative in item seven. So uh, as it relates to 78.5, I would say that all those would be studied in the, um, in the environmental document. Um, so we don't uh, we don't even have general purpose link connectors there. So we would look at the full suite of connectors. Um, so to Elisa's description, we probably should think of them as managed lanes where both carpool lanes and express lanes are an operational variation. So ma managed lanes would probably be the, be the more correct um, study at, name at this part of the study. Well, since they're in the document as HOV connectors, I, I understand you're going to study other alternatives, but what I don't want is definition sneaking in before the board has approved them or approved any of these changes. This is what's in the RTIP. This is what, when we, when we said these were priority corridors, this is what they were, and the definition seems to be changing without the board taking a position on it. So um, 
I'll have a motion later on that, but uh, I, I just want the language to be consistent that from what we approved, what's in the RTIP, what we're talking about. So it, managed lanes, express lane, HOV lanes seem to be used um, quite fluidly and, and uh, mean different things. So um, that's my comment on that. So do you have any other questions on the 78s? All right, how about the uh, Central Mobility Hub here? Sharon Humphreys will present on that one. Good morning, my name is Sharon Humphreys and I am a principal engineer here at Sandag and I'd like to thank um, you all for providing us an opportunity to provide you detailed information on the Central Mobility Hub. Providing a better public transportation connection to the airport has long been a concern of the public and the region. And towards that end, in 2018, the board approved a million dollars and the development of an airport connectivity committee that developed four alternatives to provide better connection to the airport. The first one you're seeing here is a tunnel uh, to the airport and it's um, concurrent with that time frame. The Navy is also seeking consideration of revitalization of the NAVWAR facility. And so this created a unique opportunity to consider that as a potential alternative to provide that better public transportation connectivity to the airport. It is one of, um, of um, several alternatives that are being considered. So the first one you're seeing here is the tunnel. Um, the second alternative is an above grade um, automatic people mover to the airport. Um, if, if there's a possibility to show um, that image, um, it actually goes around um, Pacific Highway and connects back to the airport. Um, another alternative is the Intermodal Transit Center, which is located farther south. And the fourth alternative that was brought to the board was a trolley connection that essentially comes off of um, the rail at Laurel Street. So when these were brought back to the board in September of 2019, the board provided direction to staff that we continue analyzing these alternatives and in September of that same year, 2019, the board authorized um, $40 million to be spent on environmental clearance and preliminary engineering for the um, further analysis that the board had directed. And so uh, originally the funds had not been programmed um, for that analysis until the FY 23 to 25. But because of the unique opportunity presented by the uh, consideration of the NAVWAR facility as an alternative site and the Navy's uh, deep and imminent concern to develop uh, better cybersecurity facilities at that site, we have advanced uh, the analysis to this time frame, although we have not made any commitment to the Navy that we will be advancing that particular alternative. We're still considering the four alternatives. Um, well, two of them at the Concepts 1 and 2 at the NAVWAR facility, also the Intermodal Transit Center and the Trolley Connection. We'll be analyzing all of those through the environmental process. And of course, returning to this this committee and the board uh, for further direction as we advance on the project. Uh, I'd like to entertain any questions that you might have. Do we have any questions? I see Vice Chair, thank you. Video thanks, up. thanks, Chair. Um, it wasn't too long ago we were in Washington D.C. Uh, on a Sandag trip. Uh, Might have been in, in association with the Chamber of Commerce in San Diego, and there was some initial discussions with the FAA about the their basic unwillingness to allow a tunnel to go under a single runway airport. Um, has there been a change in in that position on the part of the FAA, and so we're going to keep it in the mix at this point? Or at, at what point do we um, focus on the the more uh, the less challenging um, aspects of the project, i.e., not tunneling? 
Yes, the FAA has provided us a letter saying that they do not want to have any um, disruption. We have a single runway international airport. It's one of the busiest airports. Um, it's the busiest. It used to be. <laughs> In the uh, in the country, and um, they've made it very clear they want no disruption in our services. And um, we recognize that the tunnel option is quite a leap. You, you know, if we're able to to determine that um, it is uh, you know not feasible without disrupting their services, then it will be eliminated from the consideration. Um, but uh, we have to do the studies and do the analysis to uh, see whether that's the case. But certainly the FAA has made it clear they want no disruption to their, their resume. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I, if I may. Mr. Chair, if I may add um, to, uh, to Mr. Sankey's question as to what Sharon said. The, the FAA obviously did uh, have concern because it is a, a one runway airport, but we're still having discussion. We, we don't know whether um, they're saying no now means no or there is some specification, but just for the rest of you to know, uh, a, a tunnel to the airport from the site is less than a mile and a cost to you know, it could be less six, seven hundred million dollars. Whereas, if you go above ground, is three miles, three some miles, and the cost is in the billions. So, uh, we would like to discuss. Obviously, we're not going to do anything that the FAA doesn't agree with. It's, that's why Sharon uh, is right correctly when she said it's still considered. We're going to have meetings with the FAA. Uh, just reminding all of you that there is a tunnel now exists under that runway, and I a foot diameter tunnel uh, for other purposes. So it's not impossible to engineer a tunnel that can be guaranteed not to fall, but that's why it's still on the table and we have more discussions uh, to do with our partner from FAA. Thank you. Thanks, Hassan. I, I, I'm a bold thinker like you too, um, but the problem of going a mile, you have to get awfully deep to get safe and, and then you have to get back up real quick because the shortness of the tunnel presents challenges in, in and of itself. Um, and my second question, Sharon, involves the relationship between these four options and, and MTS, who um, has all along and even through our initial processing of the public opinion about um, the proposed tax measure, which obviously is on the back burner, um, one of the most popular items in our polling for projects was, was trolley to the airport. And it, it, it just seems like a, like a no brainer that somebody should come out of the convention center when we have conventions again, or come out of hotels when they're open again, and be able to go directly to the airport without having to uh, go another mile and a half north and then ride another mile and or another three miles, I guess it was what Hassan said to get back to the place. So um, I, I want there to be some practical um, and meaningful discussions with MTS about this. And, and uh, as a board member at MTS, and I don't know if the good mayor from National City has some thoughts on this too, but um, I know the airport's somewhat agnostic. They've created a spot for it. And now we're all trying to figure out what makes the best sense for the region. Um, I'm not afraid to think big, but I also wanna think most usefulness to the customer. Um, and so let's, let's make sure that MTS and the planning for trolley to the airport um, gets the attention it deserves in this process, as opposed to, uh, tunnels that that will likely be be significantly more than seven hundred million dollars. So um, anyway, that that's and that, so again, Sharon, the question would be, what's the relationship to MTS and this planning process? Um, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, just last week, uh, I provided an update to Sharon Cooney and Heather Fury at MTS on where we are in the planning process. This is uh, early days. We've just um, selected a consultant to support us in the environmental clearance and preliminary engineering effort. So all of this input is excellent input and um, we will be uh, partnering with uh, MTS and North County Transit District to make sure as we advance this project that we have a uh, regional consensus on moving forward with the best project for the region. Okay. I mean, we have transit to the airport now. You can ride the train to Santa Fe from up north and you can ride the, the bus from downtown to the airport. 
Um, but we need to do a better job for our region. And uh, I certainly look forward to, and I'm sure everybody on the committee feels the same way, looking forward to making sure we put together the best project for our region. Um, Sharon, thanks very much for your report. Thank you. Mayo, Mayor Sotelo Solis, I see you. You're yeah. muted. You're muted there, Madam Mayor. No, can't hear. Say something. No. You know, I don't know, any staff help her out or if there's something at our end? It shows the, the mayor with an open mic, so I'm not sure. Mayor, check your uh, computer as well. It may be muted, not just the Zoom. Uh, you want to text it in or if you have a question? I don't know. <laughs> Phone number she can call? So much a button my wife would like to have. If there is a dial in number, we can supply it to you in chat. Okay. Mayor, you may also text your question to me and I can read that into the record for you. Okay, I have a, well, we try to resolve that. I have a question um, concerning uh, the last. On page 11, um, the last part of the narrative, um, it says, due to a unique and imminent opportunity to partner with the Navy and considering the CH CMH at the NAVWAR site, the Central Mobility Hub at the NAVWAR site, the environmental clearance and, preliminary, and preliminary engineering activities for the Central Mobility Hub have been advanced with available cash flow to be reimbursed when the federal funding becomes available. Um, I'm just curious, is there any limitations on how much cash we can put towards this in, in hopes that federal funding becomes available? Because my concern is the federal funding doesn't become available. So what I'm wondering is, is there any limitations on how much available cash flow can be put towards this is there a limit? Uh, is there a top end? Uh, it just, it seems very uh, open-ended here is how, is we're just putting cash flow towards this and hoping, keeping our fingers crossed. So is there any, Hassan, I'm not sure if you have that or if that's something that can come back to us. Um, I'm just concerned about the limitations, if, if there's any limitations on those. Hi, Hi Mr. One Chairman, this is Lucien Nose, you're not gonna address that. So uh, your question is, is there any limitation? Yes, there would be a limitation in terms of, uh, the, the, the availability of funding is essentially formula funding that comes to the region. That's uh, determined by formula or population and so forth. So we have a very good idea of how much money uh, we anticipate to get on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, so based on that annual appropriation, that's essentially where the limitation is. We really cannot go over and above what our annual uh, appropriation uh, and or apportionment uh, would be. I guess I'm, I'm really asking more towards this project. If we're going to just, is, is there a limit? Is there like a, I don't know, $75 million limit on how much we're willing to put forward to this? We, well, keeping our fingers crossed that the money is going to be coming from the feds. Yeah, definitely. So essentially, you know, the, the board controls uh, the purse strings of the agency. And so you know, the, the full dollar amount that you see for this particular project was approved by the board back in September. Um, and so to the extent that that uh, amount was approved, that's as much as we can hope to, to either advance or, or, or be reimbursed by the federal government. We cannot uh, go over and above that. And so it's really the board that sets the limit. So is that the 40 million? Because I'm looking at that page right now. What was, so, yeah. so we... Yeah potentially could advance up to $40 million towards this effort um, uh, in, 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 in no more, apparently, that's until correct. it after right. back. Okay, that's well, that's, that's kind of, that's what I was looking for. Okay. Here? Yes. Oh, I'm in. This is my, uh, Sotelo Solis. <laughs> we can hear you loud and clear. All right. Well, I just wanted to share that uh, since, uh, uh, Member Sankey had asked me about the MTS position. I think it's important 
you know, when we did put the, the, the hold or the pause on our Elevate San Diego efforts, um, you know, we, we recognize the, the impact of COVID-19, but uh, I want to stress that it's been extremely uh, positive to see that both SANDAG and MTS are in constant conversation regarding these efforts. And when we have two major um, entities, you know, having that dialogue, but also to wanting to leverage and maximize, um, you know, the, the accessibility, both for our residents, uh, those uh, employees and the future uh, travelers, uh, I wanna stress that um, uh, MTS uh, has been working with Standag on the studies. So for now, all alternatives are still on the table. So there really is no concerns as of, uh, you know, today. Uh, I think that it's, it really speaks volumes to the fact that when we have that open communication, both with the airport, Sandag, and MTS, we really are trying to see how we can leverage all those efforts. So I thank uh, Mr. Sankey for the, for the question on behalf of MTS. And, uh, you know, all, alternate, uh, all the alternatives are still on the table. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments or people had questions on any of these projects? I appreciate the time and effort that was put into here um, for this, this item and uh, for bringing it back and giving us some explanation. It always helps uh, to help us uh, uh, figure out with so many projects uh, what's going on with some of them. Um, I would like to, I'll make a motion to approve, but I, but I want to make a, an amendment to the, uh, um, the language here. Just on, the, on the 78. Um, and that would be the, uh, the, the language in the 78, the narrative, it does not match the language in the, in the um, RTIP in item eight, and also in the RTIP is explained by, um, in item seven here. So I'd like to ask that this item come back, it doesn't have to be a presentation, but just come back to the next meeting with the language that matches the RTIP um, uh, language and as was it was also that same language that was in, in place when the, we made this a priority project. I, I don't like the fact that there's different uses of express lanes, managed lanes, and HOV connectors. I like them all to be consistent with the uh, uh, with the RTIP as it is today. And I realize there's going to be changes potentially down the road with the, uh, the connectivity or the uh, corridor um, uh, language and once the study is done. But for right now, this is the language as, as it is, and I'd like this report to reflect and uh, have that, sim that same language be consistent. Hey, Ch Chair Desmond? Yes. Hi, this is Jose Nuncio again. If maybe I can address your, your, your question or your comment there. So you're right in, in the sense that uh, the 78 corridor, uh, this project was initially programmed uh, with a description that says HOV lane. And that's how you know, the initial scope uh, of the project is. And you raise a very good question um, or comment regarding you know, the, the consistency and the description. So as the, the environmental process and the series of options uh, are developed and the final solution in terms of, you know, or the ultimate solution in terms of what uh, the board is going to approve is made, uh, an ARCTIP amendment could be made uh, at that time or you know, whenever the board wants uh, to reflect that uh, that appropriate scope. So this is really more of uh, just a, a description that was uh, included when the project was initially uh, programmed, but it, it's not to say that that would be sort of, you know, cast in stone, uh, that the board would still have the ab nope. ability. Not asking for that. Just, just for purposes of this report and how it's described today, it should be consistent. So it's not. I realize it could change and the board could change it later, but the board has not changed it. So I think it needs to be consistent. I, I agree with you. It could change later. We could change the tip later on, but we haven't. So I'd like to have the language consistent in this report. Just, and I'm only talking about this report that it all matches up because it doesn't right now. So I, that's a motion I'm putting out there that you, you bring it back with the, the consistent language as it is today and uh, as it's described um, uh, in the RTIP. Um, I'll second for the sake of discussion. This is Vice Chair Sankey. Um, thank you, guys. Um, two questions. One, um, uh, Joanne Schivoni is trying to get in. So, Jim, if you do, do your best to give, give her a shout. And then um, um, I, I think 
Jose, you're right. There's there's ways to change it now, but I do concur uh, with the chair that that having it the way it is now reflected properly throughout the document is the best way to move forward. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sankey. I see. So I, I, I wanted to know is this was not initially a voting item. Is uh, this is a discussion and possible action. Okay. Well, that, I, I concur with your. Uh, thank you. Um, may, I'm sorry, uh, Johanna Schiaboni, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'm not sure you can hear me. Perfect. Can't That's what I was going to chair, 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 chair that uh, Johanna was trying to get on. Thank you. Okay. Gotcha. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so thank you for the, the comments. Uh, I just wanted to um, echo of uh, um, Bill Sankey's comment. I'm not sure the airport, the airport may be agnostic as to the choice, but we certainly support the concept and the idea of connectivity to the airport. So I just wanted to underline that um, and ask a question of Sharon. Are you also, <laughs> are you also meeting regularly? Um, I assume you are, I assume the answer is yes. Um, but with the airport staff to loop them into the progress on um, the study and, and planning um, of the potential alternatives? Um, yes, absolutely. And um, the airport, the city of San Diego and the port have, and SANDEC have signed a, an, a memorandum of understanding so that everybody is sharing information and working collaboratively to make sure that um, we, the reason that there hasn't been an improved public transportation connection to the airport is because it's really hard. Um, there's a lot of congestion, there's a lot of traffic, there's a lot of um, you know, competing interest in the area. So having that MOU with everybody working collaboratively in the region is, has been just tremendously uh, powerful in terms of moving things forward. So we're, and we're also partnering with Caltrans to look at um, options for um, better freeway connections. So yes, we are meeting pretty much uh, weekly with the port, the airport, and um, the city. Uh, and Caltrans uh, to analyze those efforts. Part of that, um, those findings will come out of, we have the comprehensive multimodal corridor plans and um, that is the planning effort that will help inform the environmental clearance and preliminary engineering for the central mobility hub. So I can assure you that um, the collaboration is happening between staff and it's, it's a pretty exciting time to be working in the Midway District. Yeah, and I believe that was the case in light of the MOU, and I just wanted to underline the point for today. Um, and then um, my other question is whether you have a sense or you can, you can give us a window into sort of possible projected timing of uh, any of the four options that are on the table and being, um, you know, studied at the at the moment. So uh, at or this point too early. So at this point in time, there's a number of concurrent efforts moving forward. So the Navy is doing, uh, is analyzing environmental clearance for their potential improvements at the site. Um, two of the options they're considering will be um, consideration of a central mobility hub at that site. Um, we will be moving forward over the next um, engineering and then moving forward at that point with uh, funding alternatives and and we're exploring some innovative uh, solutions with regard to public private partnerships and other funding alternatives to advance improvements in the area so um, after after that one at 18 months to uh, two-year timeline um, we'll have well, certainly, I think we'll have a much better vision within the next year um, what the future will hold. But but we're um, we're leaving no stone unturned with regard to future funding, and um, I think we'll have be able to have a much better idea on that within a, a year, and be, and be of course uh, updating this um, this committee as um, as requested and appropriate. Terrific. Those are all my questions. Thanks. Hey, Thank Johanna. I was on that airport board for twelve years. Where's that? Where's that secret tunnel? <laughs> you know what? I, I was as enlightened as you were, Jim. I, I thought to myself, I'm, I'm going to need to learn more about that. So <laughs> yeah, maybe it's there. Never, never was in a briefing. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I at the um, community uh, resources meeting, they showed a map of that. It's a, it's a utility tunnel and also for fueling. And, and they talked about it as part of the new um, ramp fuel uh, addition project that's going on over there. So there's, yeah, that's a fuel tunnel under there. Oh, all right. Um, okay, so Here. there's, yes, you have a Hi. question for somebody? Again. So I just wanted to ask a point of clarification uh, and, and maybe Amberlynn can, can weigh in on this, but given that the description that you're uh, uh, asking about is also included as part of um, uh, item eight, uh, I just wanted to have maybe Amberlynn weigh in on it. Item eight is fine, because that's, that's got the same, that's got the consistent language. It's item seven that doesn't. Okay, Chair, so then if I could just clarify the motion as I understand it. The motion is to direct staff to revise the report to item number seven as noted and bring back to the Transportation Committee for consideration and approval. Yeah, and you can even put it on consent if you want. I just want the language to be consistent uh, in the narrative as well as in the R tip so that we're all on the same page. And I realize the corridor study could change everything, but as it is now, this is, I just want to get it consistent. So that was, uh, that's the answer. And Chair Desmond, just to clarify, you're referring exclusively to State Route 78, correct? The well, narrative in I the am, but if you find other inconsistencies, I think they should probably be changed as well. But I, I didn't see it on the 67, any inconsistencies, it was primarily 78, but the, and that's why I asked for the uh, description of, of the uh, difference between express lanes and managed lanes and things like that. And it, so it was. So yeah, I appreciate that. I just want to get the clarification on this item. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any other further discussion, comments? Love. Yes, Chair. This, this is Monica Montgomery. I just, I try to put my camera okay. on. Maybe right. I'll speak to you. Hey, um, I, just, um, I, I just have one last question for clarification on the motion. Okay. Um, are you trying to make this language consistent with what will be in item eight or, or is it, uh, is it a more uh, definitive, um, um, more defined um, based on the way that the managed lanes are, are broken down. Like, I don't understand. Okay. Uh, what I don't want to do is cause even more confusion while we're trying to clarify. Okay, fine. No, I'm not trying to change the, uh, the RTIP language is the current language for the 78. And, and I'm trying to match that. Uh, so I'm not trying to change that in the RTIP language at all. I'm not trying to change anything uh, you know, in, any project or anything like that. All I'm trying to do is make sure the language is consistent and it's not consistent in the narrative of this item. There is, if you look at, it, at page, I forget, um, I think it's page nine. Uh, there is a um, RTIP language in which it specifically spells out, which is correct in item seven, the RTIP language in item seven, the RTIP language in item eight are consistent and the same. The narrative's not uh, in the staff report. So I just want oh, to make sure okay. the staff report is the same. Okay. Okay. Thanks. That's all. Okay. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Chair Desmond, we need to ask for public comment on this item. Sorry. 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 Do we have any public comment? Yes, sir. I do see one hand raised. Okay. Do you want to call on that person? Sorry. I'm I'm trying to get to it. Nicole Burgess. Hi, thank you, Desmond and others. Welcome, happy Friday. I just do want to make a comment on the airport connection and it's um, as a San Diegan that loves the outdoors and loves the beautiful weather, it is a little um, sad that we don't have an amazing, beautiful, innovative above ground. I know existing right of way is a, is a, uh, is a tough one, so we go underground. But San Diego is too beautiful to go underground. Show me the connection. I have one, a beautiful air tram model that goes from the airport to the convention center, up Pack Highway to Old Town Spy War, now for beautiful redevelopment in Midway District, and then back down. And if you want to put a tunnel, if we ever can, that would be fantastic. But put us back up onto Laurel into our beautiful County Administration Waterfront Park and show us the waterfront from 30 feet above ground and put us on this people mover that we can build my, you know, I have innovative uh, entrepreneur people that are willing to put money into this project. 
So I would love for that to be as part of a study. I'm too late on a motion. I'm too late on anything. I Do I send an email to all those or do I just speak to you all now? I'm going to save it and let you just foster that idea. And perhaps one day we can explore a really uh, amazing kind of uh, mover that highlights all the beautifulness of San Diego. So just something food for thought for all of you. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Ms. Burgess. Um, is that the only one, Tessa? Thank you, Chair. I do not see any other hands raised for this item. Okay, now we'll try the roll call vote. Thank you. On item number seven, the motion on the floor, San Diego County Regional Airport Authority, Joanna Schiavone. Schiavone, yes. Mr. Chair, before we go into further uh, to voting, Mr. Chair Desmond, this is uh, Mayor Sotelo Solis. Can we get a clarification on the motion on the floor? Just one more time restating it, please. To make the narrative of item seven consistent with the language of the RTIP language, which is in item eight. And again, it's not to change content, it's just for nope. consistency. Just to, to, so that the narrative matches what the description is today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. City of San Diego, Council Member Monica Montgomery. Um, I, I, I'm reluctant to vote yes because I don't want any unintended consequences um, for this, but um, I, I will vote no. County of San Diego, Chair Jim Desmond. Yes. East County, Council Member Bill Baber. Yes. Metropolitan Transit System, Mayor Alejandra Sotelo Solis. Sotelo Solis, now. North County Coastal, Mayor Jewel Edson. Edson, no. North County Inland, Mayor Paul McNamara. McNamara, yes. North County Transit District, Deputy Mayor Jack Feller. Uh, this is just a simple fix, yes. Port of San Diego, Commissioner Gary Benelli. Benelli, yes. South County, Vice Chair Bill Sandkey. Sandkey, yes. Thank you. That item passes with three no votes and the remainder ayes. All right, thank you very much. Um, moving on to item eight. Item eight is a public hearing. We have to uh, open a public hearing for this item. This is proposed 2020 Transnet Program of Projects, 2018 Regional Transportation Improvement, Amendment number 14. Um, do we have any uh, questions on this one at all? Um, or a short presentation? What's this? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Chair Desmond, this is Sue Alpert, um, yeah. senior, senior financial programming analyst with the presentation. Okay. Um, okay, so good morning, Chair Desmond and members of the Transportation Committee. Item number eight is the proposed final 2020 Transnet Program of Projects added to the 2018 Regional Transportation Improvement Program, or RTIP, as amendment number 14. The draft amendment was released by the Transportation Committee for a 30-day public comment period on July 17th. Today, the Transportation Committee is being asked to hold a public hearing for the 2020 Transnet Program of Projects. As a reminder, the Regional Transportation Improvement Program is the five-year program of projects that implements the regional plan. In order to satisfy the requirements of the Transnet Extension Ordinance within the restrictions created by the Safe Vehicle Rule, staff have prepared an update to the Transnet Program of Projects for fiscal years 21 through fiscal year 25 which is added to the 2018 RTIP as amendment number 14. Amendment number 14 also reflects the programming of the fiscal year 21 SANDAC annual budget. Attachment two on page 71 of the agenda is the draft 2020 Transnet Program of Projects as submitted and approved by each local agency. This attachment is provided to illustrate all five years of the POP 
as the current RTIP will only show the programming of the first three years, which are fiscal years 21 through 23. Attachment three shows the changes that were made during the public comment period. All changes were made by agencies and there were no comments from the public provided. Also, as I understand, there was a question about it. Um, Stan 132, which is the Elvira to Marina double track project was removed from amendment number 14 and included in amendment number 15, which is an admin mod processed under delegation, as there was a time sensitive funding transfer needed for the Del Mar Bluffs. The project is not removed from the RTIP. Amendment number four on page 124 of the agenda is the summary of changes report showing the prior and revised project cost for each project, including key projects that are detailed in the previous item. In attachment five, beginning on page 144, you will find the proposed changes included in this amendment. In this report, you will also see a column for future funds. This has been added in order to illustrate funding, which falls outside the five years of the RTIP. Therefore, the Transportation Committee is asked to one, hold a public hearing and receive public testimony for the 2020 Transnet Program of Projects, and to recommend that the Board of Directors adopt the Regional Transportation Commission Resolution number RTC 2021-01, approving amendment number 14 to the 2018 RTIP, and adopting the Transnet POP for fiscal year 21 through fiscal year 25. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Sue. Um, do we have any, we, this is a public hearing, so do we have any members of the public that want to uh, weigh in on this item, Tessa? Thank you, Chair. I am not seeing any hands raised on this item. Do we need to vote to close the public hearing or can we just do that? Just do it. Chair, this is just close. Oh, okay. Sorry, go ahead, Emily. Well, before I- No vote is necessary to close the hearing if there's no further public comment. Okay, how about any member comments on, on item eight? I'll make a motion to approve item eight. Second. Okay. Second. Sorry. It's okay. And, and this is the language I was trying to make consistent with seven. But anyways, this is, um, so we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion or comments? Yes, yeah, sure. I, it's Monica Montgomery. I, I just have a couple questions on this item. Um, uh, if, if that's okay. Um, okay, thanks. So uh, I want to thank staff for, for, for all of this uh, work. I did um, see quite a few District 4 projects of interest, so thank you for that. Um, with regards to the project by Sandag, the, uh, the I-805 and the 94 bus on shoulder demonstration project, uh, it includes procurement of 16 new compressed uh, natural gas uh, buses. Um, I, I just want to know what the timeline is to transition to the zero gas emission uh, buses. I'm going to ask to ask someone else from staff to jump in on that one. Okay. While uh, we're getting someone to jump in on that, just my last question would be about uh, Sandag's interaction with our uh, community planning groups. I know we have the, a good relationship with the CBOs. Um, but I wanted to, there's a lot of intersection between the CIP projects that um, our community planning groups discuss. So I wanted to see if there's any thought or any work done to um, reach out to those planning groups um, so that they know that this is also a source that they can, um, they can talk about outside of this public comment, uh, the hearing that they can talk about their projects of, of priority. Um, of course, uh, each um, city that held, uh, that, that submitted projects to their TIP was required to hold a public hearing. And we made an attempt to notify um, the community-based organizations when those hearings were scheduled. Um, so they, they had an opportunity to attend the city's public hearings as well, participate in those. Um, and for Sandag projects, um, all the projects that are programmed are included in the budget. Um, so those projects have been reviewed multiple times um, in this forum and at the board forum. And um, I don't know for sure what the total outreach was, but we will also be reaching out to community-based organizations when we do um, the 2021 RTIP update, which we're com is coming up um, this fall. 
Okay. Um, so at the very least, I would like to see if our community planning groups could be included in that mailing list. Um, it's just that they are the, in our process, I know at the city of San Diego, they um, are included, you know, in that process. So I know the CBOs uh, can reach out to them, but it would be really good since they are actual planning groups. Of course, yeah, we'll get that email list um, and we'll make sure that, especially when we do the draft uh, for the 2021 that we get that out to them. Okay, thank you so much. And the other question, if there's, if uh, it's, it's fine if that is emailed to me as well. I don't want to hold anything up. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any other mem board member or com uh, committee member comments? Mr. Chair, I might be able to help Monica with uh, our council member Montgomery with, with the, uh, the electric bus question. Um, we're talking about getting 16 buses. If we, if we bought them today as electric, we'd only be able to afford eight. Um, it's the, the conversion by state law is up until 2040 and MTS has a, a very robust program uh, go on going testing those things and, and we're, we have purchase uh, forward looking um, buses, um, not quite as fast as I think everybody would like, but at a pace that, that lets route conversion happen. And um, we've got some routes that simply don't have uh, electric bus capability end to end because of the distance. Um, maybe technology will catch up with that by the time 2040 comes along. So, so uh, MTS, as, as you know, as a board member, council member is, is very committed to the zero bus, zero emission buses. Um, but the CNG thing purchased now is gonna give us an opportunity to get this bus on shoulder programs going significantly sooner. And also it is a proof of concept project. So we'll happily, uh, if, if this works out well, get the opportunity to work with Caltrans and, and initiate more of those routes, many of which would qualify, I would imagine, for some of our uh, ongoing zero emission bus purchases uh, into the next, you know, set of years. So I, I'm, I'm confident that MTS is, is ready to move forward um, as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. Sankey. I um, just want to always put it on the radar and whatever work we're doing together. Um, to ensure that that is a, is a top priority. When you make these major uh, purchases, you know, there is a lifetime of, of the buses and I'm gonna, you know, make sure that we are, we are on track. And I think I saw um, uh, Ms. Cooney on, on, on here as well. So she may also have an answer. Do you have some comments that are pertinent to this agenda item? Uh, Chair, I just wanted to alert um, your committee that the uh, zero emission bus transition program is going to be on our board meeting in September if anybody's interested in this subject. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, seeing no one, not, no other committee members, uh, I'm going to officially close the public hearing. Uh, we, and I'm assuming we have no other, no other public comments. Nobody snuck in, Tessa? No, uh, thank you, Chair. I do not see any further hands raised from the public. Okay. All right. Can we have a roll? We have a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Thank you. On item number eight, San Diego Regional Airport Authority, Joanna Schiavone. Schiavone, yes. City of San Diego, Council Member Monica Montgomery. Yes. County of San Diego, Chair Jim Desmond. Yes. East County, Council Member Bill Baber. Yes. Metropolitan Transit System, Mayor Alejandro Sotelo Solis. Hello, Solis, aye. North County Coastal, Mayor Jewel Edson. Edson, yes. North County Inland, Mayor Paul McNamara. McNamara, yes. North County Transit District, Deputy Mayor Jack Feller. Yes. Port of San Diego, Commissioner Gary Benelli. Benelli, yes. South County Vice Chair Bill Sankey. Sankey, yes. Thank you. Item number eight passes unanimously. All right. Thank you, everyone, for that. Um, moving on to item nine. This is a Mid Coast pro uh, Trolley Project Update. Uh, Ramon Morellis uh, from Sandeg is going to give us a presentation. Take it away, Ramon. Okay. I just needed to get up uh, on, on the screen. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Chair Desmond, uh, Vice Chair Sankey, and members of the Transportation Committee. I'm here today to present the third quarter update for the Mid Coast Trolley Project. Next slide, please. So by now, you're all likely familiar with the route map. 
just to uh, reiterate, we're actively in the process of constructing an 11 mile extension of the Blue Line Trolley from the Old Town Transit Center up to University City. Included as part of this project is the acquisition of 36 new trolley cars. It's significant to note that we are on course to start revenue service in late 2021 and still expect to finish within the $2.17 billion budget. Next slide, please. So our construction contractor, Midcoast Transit Constructors, is 80% expended on this project. Stations, track work, landscaping, and signal work are now becoming the focus of construction. Next slide, please. Now this milestone schedule has, maintained, has, has remained basically the, the same to what we had shared in the last update. Final completion and revenue service are approximately two months behind the original 2016 baseline for the project. Next slide. This banana chart is a graphical representation of how construction has progressed over time. It just serves as another indicator that construction progress continues to trend in a positive direction. Next slide. So this project has also been a huge boost to the local economy. So far, it has employed over 4,000 workers on site and paid nearly $160 million in wages to, to the workforce. Next slide. MCTC continues to utilize disadvantaged businesses at a pace that will result in meeting and hopefully exceeding their contract goal of 11.3% participation. Next slide. So it's always good to share stories of success and Sequoia Consultants is this quarter's DBE success story. They are a construction quality control service provider for MCTC. The Midcoast Trolley Project has contributed to the company's growth, including expansion across Southern California and into other states as well. Next slide. The project is also achieving success in preventing injuries to the workforce. Both the recordable and lost time injury rate, incident rates for the project are below the national average. Next slide. So moving on to construction accomplishments. Earlier this year, we completed the removal of all the false work, and, and that is the, uh, the temporary support structures uh, that are put in place to, uh, for bridge construction. Uh, we broke ground on the Noble Drive trolley station parking structure. Uh, this past spring, construction of the trolley underpass was completed with coinciding work along the La Jolla Colony Drive uh, being completed just this last month. Station construction is the current focus on the project and significant progress has been made at all nine stations. Track work is nearing completion and both landscape and signal work continues throughout the entire alignment. Since we last met, we also celebrated the completion of two major concurrent projects along the Midcoast Corridor, the San Diego River Bridge Double Track Project and the Avira to Marina Double Track Project. And finally, the concurrent Boyd Drive Improvements Project is underway and is anticipated to be completed in fall of 2021. Next slide. Now from that list of accomplishments, let me show you how progress has been made to date on the project going from the south to the north. The, these images show the trolley bridge over the San Diego River, including the concurrent work that's going on related to landscaping. Next slide. The slide is, it kind of shows the, the work that's ongoing at the Tecolote uh, Transit Center. Um, you know, they're working actively on completing the parking lot and have already started the process of installing lighting fixtures, fixtures on the platform. Next slide. This is the, the Claremont Drive uh, trolley station. Um, you know, work on this thing is continuing as well and proceeding uh, on track. Next slide. Uh, the next station is the Balboa Avenue Trolley Station. Uh, this kind of shows the, the finishing work um, that they're doing on the platform. It also is representing some uh, retaining walls, precast retaining walls uh, to accommodate this switchback pedestrian platform uh, access way to the platform. Next slide. This is the trolley flyover and track work along Rose Canyon, uh, just adjacent to the Carl Strauss Brewery. Uh, that bridge structure is complete and you can actually see track on the bridge at this location now too. Next slide. I mentioned earlier about the trolley underpass and La Jolla Colony Drive. This kind of picture shows uh, the work that's been completed at that location. Next slide. This is a close up view of the underpass. Uh, this is the uh, one location where uh, we do go underneath an existing roadway where we had to uh, open up that roadway to in order for us to get the uh, trolley tracks underneath that, that facility. Next slide. 
The, uh, this is uh, the trolley overcrossing just south of Nobel Drive. Uh, I think you can see in the picture uh, towards the left that the uh, parking structure is actively ongoing. Uh, we're looking to try and achieve a soft opening on that parking structure in time for um, shopping season this, this, this year. Next slide. Uh, this is a photograph of the work along the Nobel Viaduct. The contractor has been very busy setting up the railing uh, along all the bridges. Next slide. This is uh, another picture along the Nobel Viaduct uh, showing the grading work that's going on immediately behind the Whole Foods and just on the western side of Interstate 5. Next slide. Uh, this shows the station at, at, the, at the veterans at the VA hospital. Uh, next slide. So uh, I, I've decided to include the next four slides to kind of show how work has progressed near the VA medical station over these last three and a half years. Now this photograph was taken back in March 2017, just five months after major construction had started. The contractor was just starting to clear that area and was uh, more, more focused really on, on getting on Gilman. This is the June 2018 um, status of uh, the work in that area, you, you can really get a good idea of what the trolley alignment looks like in, in this area. Next slide. Now this is June 2019 and you can see that much more of that viaduct uh, has been advanced relative to construction. Next slide. And this is uh, the last photograph that shows uh, the bridge work uh, for all intents and purposes complete and back in January of 2020. Next slide. So moving on, uh, this is the south facing view of the aerial guideway featuring the Pepper Canyon station on UCSD campus, the VA station, and uh, way up to the top half of this picture, the uh, Nobel Drive uh, station as well. Next slide. This is the uh, Pepper Canyon station uh, on UCSD campus. Uh, the column support for the stairways are um, in, and the elevator towers have been placed and you can see that the canopy shelter steel structures have also been placed uh, at this station. Next slide. So in addition to the trolley work, we're doing a significant amount of work in the area of our Boyd station, which is on the east campus portion of UCSD. Uh, those elevator towers uh, are, are getting or receiving glazing, glass glazing, and uh, the uh, stairways that are being placed and the pedestrian uh, crossings are is also in place. Next slide. This is the executive drive uh, trolley station. Again, pedestrian bridges and the elevator towers are also uh, under construction. Uh, the canopy steel shelters are prefabricated in Los Angeles County and are trucked down and installed in one piece at all the platforms. And you can see that in the picture in the lower right hand side. Next slide. This is the underside of the executive drive uh, trolley station where the contractor has been busy uh, doing the surface finishing of all the concrete. Next slide. And this is uh, the last station. This is the UTC Transit Center uh, station. Uh, the pedestrian bridges uh, have been, are being worked on as well as the elevator towers and uh, other um, elements too. Next slide. So we spend every, uh, every day assessing and managing risks on the project. Now, one of the highest project risks remains the unsettled right-of-way acquisition costs. Of all the properties we need for construction, six still remain outstanding and are in various phases of negotiation. We have made significant progress on the Fed Street substation site and continued discussions with sdg &E are proving beneficial for getting new electrical service throughout the entire project. Construction costs and other unknown risks are diminishing as civil and structural work get closer to being completed. Now, although these types of risks are diminishing, they do occasionally pop up uh, unexpectedly. Uh, for example, the recent news of cement and fly ash shortages is impacting concrete deliveries. This will have some impact to cost and schedule for some specific work elements on the project, but we don't anticipate that it will affect the overall completion date. And then finally, adverse costs and schedule impacts resulting from the effects of COVID-19 have not materialized on our project. Next slide. So I want to quickly show some pictures of some of the other MCTC construction work in the corridor. This is the San Diego Bridge, San Diego River Bridge double track project. Uh, that project was recently completed back in February or substantially completed back in February of 2020. Next slide. 
Uh, additionally, the Valera de Marina double track project was also recently completed uh, just this past July. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a shot of the Rose Canyon bike path, which was open in May in its final alignment. Next slide. Work activities on the Rose Creek Bikeway are also continuing, and we hope to have that uh, project completed before the end of this year. Next slide. And finally, uh, completing the aesthetic enhancements to the Gilman Drive Bridge are, are all that remain and to get this project completely done. And we anticipate that that would be done by early next year. Next slide. So public outreach efforts continue, though we've made revisions to our process in light of COVID-19. Construction tours and in-person media events have been postponed. The public involvement team also ran a social media campaign this past spring to inform the public of the many safety precautions implemented to allow this critical project to continue amid the pandemic. We continue to provide update to several community planning groups, as well as city council staff from districts directly impacted by project construction. Lastly, opening day planning efforts have commenced as the project nears its anticipated completion in late 2021. Next slide. So if anybody wants to know a little bit more about our project, we have an email address, a hotline number, and a web address. And for those that are uh, social media minded, uh, we have Facebook and Twitter sites as well, and shift uh, for specific information to the UTC area. Next slide. That concludes my presentation. Uh, I'll be happy to entertain any questions that might be asked. Uh, thank you for the presentation and the update. Uh, we went through very quickly, so appreciate the time effort. Um, do you have any questions? I don't, I'm looking at Mr. Sankey. You got a question? A yeah, quick one. Um, how's the progress on the auxiliary lane that's going just uh, on 5 South on the La Jolla Village drive off ramp? I know that was an add on to the project and it, it, that's a particularly tough choke point there. I'm, I'm glad we're improving it. Is it done yet? It will be completely done before the end of this month. Outstanding. Thank you very much. Okay, I see uh, Deputy Mayor Feller hand up. Thank you. I love construction. I just hope you can keep it looking pretty. Uh, I, I, I hope that's graffiti resistant stuff you put out there. So thank you. Yes, uh, you know, I, I, I second that idea. I certainly love construction. I've been in construction for a very long time. It, it's really nice to, to see um, work progress from two dimensions into three dimensions and, and, and getting people to use it. it it's, it's certainly uh, a fascinating thing for me. Thank you. Mayor uh, Edson. Thank you. Um, I have a comment, not a question. I just wanted to comment. Um, thank you, Ramon, for the presentation. An amazing amount of work has been done um, since COVID began. I, I'm used to regularly driving past that on Fridays to Sandag and haven't seen it personally, visually since, you know, for months. Amazing. Thank you so much. It looks great. And thank you for the presentation with all of, of the um, photos for us to look at. Thanks. Yeah, I, I appreciate, I certainly appreciate the kudos. You know, we, we, um, we, we perform over $20 million worth of work on a monthly basis. And, uh, you know, just to give some indication, I mean, that's the size of uh, a major construction uh, project in and of itself. So it, there is a lot of work that's going on and through the efforts of, you know, staff, uh, our contractors, the, the craftspeople, um, you know, and our consultants. I mean, it's, it's truly been a, a pleasure to work on and it's good to see that it's going on track. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Sotelo Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, I wanted to echo the sentiment of my colleagues. It's great to see so much prog progress being done on the Mid Coast Trolley. Uh, I've shared before as a former student and an alumni of uh, UC San Diego, I remember being on campus and this being just a dream. Now it's uh, coming. Uh, coming true and it's we're seeing it and I actually lived in Pepper Canyon apartments so seeing and hearing you uh, mention Pepper Can uh, Canyon brought back a lot of memories I was even an RA uh, my my third uh, my senior year there as well so 
all of these uh, bring back really good memories, but it, again, it really shows that in fact, when we want things to, to happen, we work together with multiple agencies, we can make that a possibility. And I just wanted to share on behalf of um, MTS, uh, the Midcoast tr uh, Trolley uh, Construction, uh, excuse me, the Midcoast Construction uh, Company that is also working on um, uh, multiple projects. They are helping us build our old town transit expansion. So as we talk about leveraging and making sure that resources are being tapped into when they're right around the corner, uh, MTS is very proud to have uh, partnered with, uh, you know, the Midcoast uh, Construction Group to make that expansion happen at our old town transit center. Uh, at one point in time, everybody's going to have to touch that space. So it's uh, thinking smart and leveraging the resources. So thank you again, Mr. Chair. Gracias, Ramon. Keep up the good work and can't wait to take that first trolley ride uh, from the border, hop on in National City, and then heading all the way up to UC San Diego. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, Tessa, do we have any uh, public comments on this item? Thank you, Chair. We do have one hand raised, Nicole Burgess. Burgess, welcome. Well, thank you, Supervisor Desmond. I appreciate the moment to comment on a couple of things. I actually have three major points. And uh, thank you, first, Ramon Rolas, for um, the presentation. And is it, it is an exciting project for our region. This is a major transit project, and we have to ensure success for us to really um, have that big bold vision for more transit. So hello to all of us out there. Really, uh, Ramon, I, I am a little concerned. I heard pedestrian bridges quite often. However, I never heard about bikes. And of course, that is my, uh, my big point. How am I going to get uh, Mayor Solis off that station and then ensure she can get that extra mile to the, the place her school classroom, right? So really like where are all the mobility, uh, fleet, fleet, um, flexible fleets of e-bikes? Let's see 200 e-bike share systems, solar e-bike share systems. Um, let's see, I will speak, uh, second point, that's my first point. Second point is the uh, Balboa Transit Station. If any of you have ever gone and tried to ride a bike around Mission Bay and that corridor, it is so treacherous. We will never ensure that this opportunity zone of PD along the highway can ensure that our folks in PD can get across there. We have to look and start building that multi-use bridge that goes across the I-5 or a tunnel that the community has been asking for. And third, I'm just going to say, I love the double tracking. It's fabulous. I ride along it. I always ride along Rose Creek. But that San Diego River crossing, for it not to include a cantilever bridge for active commuters, if anybody has ever tried to get from USC to Old Town, less than a mile, on a bike or foot, it is treacherous, it is awful, it is dangerous. And we, like Solis says, leveraging our money and leveraging our ideas to really ensure those last mile zones can be act, you know, activated with the active transportation. I apologize if I took too much time, but. I really want to say it is a collaborative effort on MTS, the city of San Diego and Sandag to ensure we get that last mile connection. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have no other, this is a discussion or possible action. If there is no action that we can just receive the report. Um, if that's okay with everybody or does anybody want to make a motion on this? We just receive the report. Thank you. All right. Item 10, uh, update on the North County Regional Comprehensive Multimodal Corridor Plan and Interstate 15 State Route 78 project. I think either Colleen Clemenson or Alan Katsup are, are doing this, uh, this presentation. Yes, thank you, Chair Desmond and members of the Transportation Committee. Um, Alan Katsup and I are pleased to be here to present this item to you today. Um, the North County Corridor CMCP includes State Route 78, 76, um, Inland Rail Trail, the Sprinter Corridor, as well as Palomar Airport Road. And I think today's discussion has been really insightful about the fact that we have projects that are identified in the regional plan and the regional transportation plan. Those get 
refined through looking at a series of alternatives in these comprehensive multimodal plans, and then that leads to actual projects and environmental and the construction of projects. And so as we talk about the North County Corridor CMCP today, um, we're also going to talk about the specific projects that are underway. And I think um, Ross from Caltrans did a really good job of describing that while we're working on planning, we can still be implementing projects at the same time. So we will be doing that today. So the next slide, maybe Alan, do you want to advance the slides as we go through? Thanks. Just wanted to mention some of the previous actions that have taken place. We might need the production team to advance. Thank you. So previous actions that have led to where we are with the comprehensive multimodal plans. In July of 2019, the board of directors um, directed staff to continue our work on the five big moves and utilizing the complete corridors model and prioritized corridors previously scheduled for investment. And then it's in September, last September, the board approved $40 million to 12 corridors, including those that were prioritized. And in February and June of this year, we have come to the Transportation Committee with updates. The next slide about why comprehensive multimodal corridor plans. One, um, in order to get funding in the future, we have to be doing our planning in a multimodal way. So if we're looking at improvements on the highways, we need to be looking at improvements on our local streets and roads, on transit, biking, and walking. And these are really greater levels of detail than what is in the regional plan. And it's the California Transportation Commission that has suggested this process in order for regions to be competitive for SB1 funds. Next slide. So probably the best example that we've been using for some time is the North Coast Corridor. We call this kind of a first generation comprehensive multimodal plan where we looked at improvements in the Low Sand Corridor, um, improvements on the, the highway, as well as bicycle, pedestrian improvements, and an overall transportation demand management program for this corridor. Next slide. As we're learning through the five big moves on how we fully integrate all of the modes within these corridors. We're talking about goods movement. We're talking about transit on highways, transit on local streets and roads, um, the application of flexible fleets, how these connect with mobility hubs. And then when it comes to the next operating system, really utilizing technology to manage the whole system. And I think these questions about managed lanes, express lanes, um, HOV lanes, hot lanes, it's all in the context of a managed lane system that allows us to prioritize whatever is needed at a particular point in time. So um, through a managed lane system, we can prioritize transit on a particular lane. Or if there's an emergency, we can prioritize emergency vehicles. Um, managing that demand dynamically. And that's really what we're talking about, about a comprehensively managed system. So next slide, these are the first phase of comprehensive um, multimodal plans that are getting underway. We've got the South Bay to Sorrento. These are kind of the, the names now that have been put together to kind of capture these broader areas. South Bay to Sorrento, the C to Santee, San Vicente, North County, which we're talking about today, and then the Central Mobility Hub and Connections. Next slide. Um, so work that's been underway, we've had several workshops with our Caltrans team to kind of pull all of these components together. We've formed more um, comprehensive teams for each of the project areas. So this includes the transit agencies, staff from um, the local jurisdictions in these areas. The teams have worked to define the geographic study areas to be included, and preliminary issues and opportunity statements have been drafted for discussion, and that was presented at the last um, time we were before you on this item with the Transportation Committee. The next slide shows the study area boundaries. I think you remember Supervisor Desmond saying, why is the North County one so big? And part of that is for us to be able to capture all of the employment that's on um, Palomar Airport Road. And so that's why you see this being one of the larger areas for um, one of the larger study area boundaries. 
The next slide shows the policy considerations that have been um, called out by the California Transportation Commission, and so these are the policy considerations that we need to be thinking about as we're doing all of this work. And with that, um, we are planning to come to you uh, with each of these priority corridors between now and December so that you can get more of a sense of the work that's getting underway, the key steps that are involved. Um, we'll be conducting outreach during this time with stakeholders and to the extent that we're able to do community outreach under the COVID circumstances, we're continuing to do that. And then we plan in the summer and fall to actually have the draft comprehensive multimodal studies ready for your review and consideration. And the phase two projects are on the next slide. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Alan Kossop, who's going to share with you what's been underway so far with our North County CMCP and work on the interchanges that is um, getting closer. So with that, Alan. Thank you, Colleen. Alan, I got a just question for you. Can you go back to the cover page on this? Yeah, I just want to point out the same thing. This item has the same issue that item seven had for me, in that the language in this item does not match the R tip that we just approved for the 78. Uh, it's express lanes, even in the title here, it says express lanes, direct connectors, project update in the narrative. It says express lanes, express lanes, express lanes across the 78. When the language in the R tip is HOV connectors, it, it, so the language here is inconsistent as well uh, as was in item seven. Just want to point that out. Thank you. Uh, yes, Chair. I was uh, I was prepared to fall on my sword and, and correct that right off the bat. So um, thank you. Well, sorry, I took your sword, but you can have, you can have <laughs> it. <laughs> um, as Colleen was talking about, uh, why do we do CMCPs? And I think you know, um, really, we think of it as the bridging document that translates those policies and those vision statements that are coming out of out of these agencies and actually translate them into a set of connected, integrated projects, actual um, projects that are seeded in time and that are integrated. Um, and this is a, a big departure from, uh, you know, not that many years ago where the agencies really planned the modes independently and there wasn't really a systems approach. And under this approach, we're really focused on creating a door-to-door -door trip and really understanding it from the user's perspective not necessarily the infrastructure's perspective. And I, uh, I wanted to add this slide to it because from, from a Caltrans perspective, while the regions are on, ongoing with their RTP processes, the state's doing the similar thing uh, for the whole state infrastructure. And the good thing about this slide is I think you see the same sort of themes and objectives that you're looking at in the five big moves, which is great to see that synergy um, sometimes the, the words might be the same, but really the, the themes, uh, I mean, the words are different, but the themes are very similar. And if you look down one level out of these objectives and you sort of pull the layers back on the onion, uh, in terms of what are the strategies to achieve, achieve these objectives, you see some of the same things on the state plan as the region's looking at. For example, uh, improving low sand service from uh, down that corridor, getting more frequency, higher trips, uh, higher volumes. Uh, reduced travel times between LA and San Diego on the Lausanne line is a good example. Uh, developing a transformational active transportation network for the state of California is another example. So in the CMCP process, um, really think of it as maybe a four-step process. Um, we've started the 78 corridor, the North County corridor in early part of this year. Uh, we're probably 25, 30% complete. And so we've got a lot of work to go, but we really we feel good about where we are. Um, those first couple steps are really understanding why people, well, you know, what are the drivers and the things that shape people's travel in this shed? Where are they trying to go? Um, what are the barriers? What are the opportunities? Um, and that's that's where we are now. Um, later on this year, we'll be then be layering on uh, alternatives and strategies. Um, to see how we can improve mobility in this in this corridor, uh, and then lastly, we we test those uh, alternatives and strategies against uh, the policy objectives of the region, 
Um, and then la uh, at the very end, we end up coming up with a phased plan for the entire system of improvement. So at the end, we really see it as an implementation blueprint that we can use to implement um, the five big moves in this corridor. And as Colleen pointed out, um, the shape of the shed um, has grown a little bit um, since you had last seen it. Um, we did some initial outreach um, to the cities and, and stakeholders try to understand what were the needs of the shed. And I think clearly we heard um, that we should include all of the city of Oceanside and we should include the uh, Camp Pendleton gates and the impact on Route 76. So the crosshatch section on the north is a little bit of growth um, since the uh, CMCP was originally programmed. Um, with this in mind, with this shape in mind, we immediately uh, set up a working group of the key agencies in this corridor. So it's the five cities, a portion of the county. A uh, county has a representative on the working group, and then NCTD. And just a little background on the corridor. Um, you know, re really is an important corridor for the entire county. Uh, roughly 600,000 uh, folks live in the corridor, uh, over 300,000 jobs. And like much of the county, it's undergone significant growth uh, in the last 25 years. It represents about 20% of the overall county in terms of population and jobs. So one of the first steps we took was, was uh, doing some listening sessions with, with all of the key cities in the corridor, NCTD, and just try to understand what were the, um, you know, what were the hot button items in transportation in their cities. Uh, and what did they see as the opportunities? Uh, I think one of the, the big themes was what I call touch points, right, where one mode touches another mode, uh, where they cross, um, you know, where freeway ramps cross arterials, where bike lanes cross, um, you know, arterials, where transit uh, impacts arterials. A lot of those touch points um, are areas of friction and where we can do a lot better. Um, it also talks about a lot of the opportunities that are coming to the corridor in, in growth-focused uh, areas, potential mobility hubs. And lastly, it really speaks to how important it is to integrate regional transportation and communities. Also, as part of this listening sessions, uh, we, we identified a number of studies that the partners are uh, working on. And so this is really positive in, in a couple of different ways. One is it shows the momentum and the energy that people are putting on mobility in this corridor. Um, it also shows that now is the right time to have this conversation because it allows us to knit these, um, these visions together. And lastly, it allows us to leverage a lot of the studies that are coming on and, and not have to reinvent the wheel. In fact, yesterday we had a great meeting with NCTD staff while they were talking to us about how we could, what in infrastructure improvements were needed to increase frequency uh, in that corridor to about 15 minute headways. So much like the RTP, uh, data analysis is really one of our first steps. Uh, but on the CMCP, we can drop down to a little further level of detail. Um, this data analysis ranges from uh, 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 incident analysis. Uh, we're looking at incident hotspots for active transportation um, and bikes, uh, all the way to major origins and destination studies. Where are people uh, moving around? Where are they headed to? Where are they coming from? Um, this exhibit, I think you've seen this exhibit before from the RTP conversation. It really speaks to where the major employment centers are in the shed. And one of the things I like to point out is, uh, you know, on the east end, those employment shut, uh, centers are centered around the Sprinter and SR-78. And as we move to the west, um, because we have a little kink in 78 and the Sprinter, the employment centers really sort of um, move away from uh, the infrastructure, the primary regional infrastructure. And that's really an important point for this, for this shed. Um, this analysis also allowed us to see that about 50% of the people who work in these areas come from this shed, um, but an equal number of people are commuting from outside the shed into these employment centers, and another equal amount are actually uh, commuting from this shed to other employment centers, uh, such as Orange County, Riverside, Sorrento Valley, Mira Mesa. 
So, uh, you know, one of the, the new tools that we have with, the, with big data is um, anonymous cell phone information. This allows us to understand what we call top routes. So how do people actually get to where they're going? Um, and this is the Palomar Business Center, Vista Business Center. Um, and what you see here is the, the red and the orange are higher volumes of people going into that, uh, into that area. And you see that on the east side, uh, people take 78 up to a point, but, but it's a lot more convenient just to cut across in San Marcos and Palomar Airport Road uh, to get there. And this really you know, points out a couple things. One, it really points out that arterials are an important part of the solutions that we're looking at in this corridor. Um, and it also, you know, it, it sort of highlights that when we put these um, different employment centers and origins and destinations in this corridor together and we layer them on top, um, you don't necessarily get a, 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 specific, a specific pattern, right? You get a lot of people, the, the centers are so diverse. Um, I like to say we've got a lot of people coming from places, going to places, and going through the corridor. And so, um, you know, that's just an extra challenge and complexity. It's not like one particular route that we can uh, address. We need to find a broad-based solution for this corridor, multimodal. So based on um, that initial outreach and the initial uh, data analysis, uh, in terms of where are we seeing key deficiencies and challenges that we need to address in the next step in terms of bringing solutions, one of the things we just talked about, right, better connecting uh, jobs and, and residential centers to the transportation system. Um, you know, that, that's a large part of it. But we also see just a lot of lost time to traveling. Uh, we've got long trips. We've got slow trips. Um, and so how can we, you know, return some of that time back to, to the traveling public? And then, like we said before, we have limited competitive travel options in this corridor. Um, and so if you're trying to get to Cal State San Marcos from Rancho Bernardo, what are your choices other than uh, a vehicle, single occupant vehicle? If you're trying to get to work from Temecula into the shed, what are your choices? So these are some of the major key areas that we'll be looking at in the next steps. And those next steps will be, uh, again, looking at sort of the toolbox, uh, which Five Big Moves gives, gives us. Um, and these five kind of squares are you know, some of the strategies, they're not totally inclusive, but, but these are, you know, highlighting some of the key strategies. And like the RTP, you know, we're going to look at these broad-based um, broad solutions, but we also need to understand better how those um, regional facilities connect into the community. So, uh, as an example, when we look at Next Generation Rapid, um, how does uh, a customer get from their vehicle from their from their bus into say Cal State San Marcos. Where is the station? What's that connectivity? Um, the CMCPs gave us a chance to look at that. Uh, so moving forward, um, you know, uh, have a number of activities going on over the next six to twelve months. Uh, we'll be beginning uh, outreach uh, to the public using a number of social platform social media platforms and trying to collect information about you know, what's important to them, what are the barriers that they see, and what are the opportunities they see. And as I said, we'd also at the same time be layering on different strategies and then modeling the performance of those strategies. Uh, on schedule to have a draft out by uh, mid next year and then the final out by fall of 21. So and as Colleen said, I want to take this opportunity to kind of segue from the CMCP uh, into implementation. And this exhibit shows some of the projects in this corridor that are at least partially funded, right? So we've, we've already talked today about the managed lanes, the connectors at both ends. Uh, funding also exists for Inland Rail Trail. And so we want to spend the rest of the presentation today looking at where we are on the 7815 uh, project at the, uh, at the east end. And so this exhibit just kind of provides a high point, uh, a high overview of what we're trying to accomplish. So we talk about those touch points, right, where one system and the other system sort of, you know, where we try to integrate the user. Uh, 7815 is a perfect example of that. As people move between both facilities, um, there isn't enough capacity to, to um, move them smoothly. 
And so what you'll see is you'll see queuing uh, and, and delay on both facilities uh, upwards 10 to 15 minutes every peak period, uh, morning and, and afternoon. And part of that, too, is also degrading not only a major interstate, but it's degrading the express lanes that we built on 15 because that queuing backs up into the existing express lanes and makes those uh, less of an attractive option. Specifically, um, this exhibit kind of shows you the scope. Um, so in addition to the uh, managed lanes connectors at 7815, there'll be an additional uh, three miles of managed lanes to the west, and then we're looking at local access improvements in San Marcos. Uh, I use this exhibit just to kind of uh, highlight another use for big data. Um, and also to demonstrate, you know, how we can use big data to make sure we're making the right investment. Um, what, and what this shows is about 50% of the folks that are on the existing connectors, the existing 7815 connectors, are really destined for interchanges within the first three miles. And so that really helps us understand uh, how we can serve those better. And, you know, if money is tight, where do you focus that funds? And, and here's an example of how we can use that data. And I didn't, uh, we won't go into a lot of detail on, on this exhibit because we have talked a lot about the, the different strategies that are under managed lanes. But I do like the image because, um, and I know last month when we talked about the RTP and the vision of the RTP, we talked about developing a managed lane system that could connect the edges of the county to the center of the county. And um, the 7815 project is an important part of that. Um, and so whether they're express lanes or, or uh, HOV lanes that really is an important part of that overall system vision. Um, and then before I wrap up, I just you know sort of talk about um, a lot of projects like the uh, I've, like the 78 managed lanes are sort of foundational elements that have existed in previous RTPs. Um, and you can see on the left side that's um, what's in the existing RTP. What's on the right side is what's in the five big moves vision. And that, that'll, you know, that consistency between those two plans help us start work uh, on implementation while planning of the rest of the systems ongoing. So um, that people always ask, why can we do both at the same time? And I think this exhibit high, sort of highlights that. So in the, um, uh, on the environmental document, uh, we're still on track to get a draft out in summer of 22 and then final draft in, or final environmental document in May of 23. Um, we had hoped to begin the public outreach uh, in May or June of this year. Uh, we had to push it to October because we had to retool our outreach and our public meeting process to be in a virtual format, um, but we should be ready to go in October. And then um, design would, could be as complete as soon as uh, 24, 2024. Um, but the project is not funded for construction, so we'll need to work through that. And then lastly, um, we're bringing up a number of communication uh, portals so that folks can send us information and ask questions. Uh, so we have a site on keepsandiegomoving.com. Uh, we have a project hotline, um, and, and more things will be coming on as we get into the, uh, into the public meetings. So with that, I will pass it back to Colleen. Got a couple of questions for you, Kat, Alan. Sir. Thank you. On slide 26 and 27, actually, somebody can put those back. Can you do 26 first? Are those the purple lines there? Are those new lanes? Are those converted? Um, general purpose lanes. I know there are express lanes coming up to about where the sign says 15 there. Um, or, uh, so what are those new lanes or, or what are those? Uh, this project would add new connectors. So that'd be new, new concrete for those purple, those purple lines. Yes, in the inside of the freeway. Okay, and then on item, then the next one, next slide. Are those, I guess now they're orange lanes, 
going into, it looks like you got it past uh, Twin Oaks Valley Road uh, there. Um, are those new lanes or are those converted general purpose lanes? Uh, this project will look at new lanes. Okay, so the new lanes going to uh, Twin Oaks Valley Road. Okay, all right, and as are the orange ones, okay. And just so you know, we're currently in the process of modeling this whole system uh, so that we can determine where the appropriate endpoint is on the west. So that'll be part of our study. Okay. Um, thank you. I don't know if Colleen wants it now. That wraps up our, our presentation. So we're happy to answer any questions that you and the committee members have. Yeah, let's see, I don't have my screen back yet. Um, Mr. Chair, Gary Benelli would like to speak. Okay, Mr. Benelli, I, I can't see, I still got the presentation up here, but okay. Thanks, Chair, just, just uh, Colleen and Alan, thanks for the presentation. Uh, as Alan said, we don't wanna reinvent the wheel. So one of the suggestions I'd have, uh, you know, for two years you had a military working group looking at access in and around uh, military installations. So being the corridor and the travel shed has expanded, uh, please include the work that the military work group did for Camp Pendleton, both on the ocean side all the way east over into to Fallbrook. You could got I, it. Thank you. Can I get the screen back that shows? I don't. I don't have the uh, people pictures. I got the. There we go. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I have the same comment on this one as I do on item seven the inconsistencies of the language. And, and Alan, I heard you calling them manage lanes. Um, the staff report calls them express lanes. Um, and the RTIP, which is the guiding document, has a different definition. So in item seven, I, I ask that we keep the same, you know, until the board changes them, keep the same definition that's in the RTIP uh, on these projects and in these reports. So. I'm going to make the same motion for this item to accept it, but, I'll, but to ask that it come back at the next meeting with the revisions in the staff update that includes the same language that's in the RTIP. So I'll make that motion. I'll second. Thank you. Do we have any other questions or discussion? Yeah, Mr. Feller. Thank you. Um, I, I missed the slide on the uh, managed lanes uh, as they approach five. That's tongue in cheek. Um, I, I'm just, again, I'm just amazed that I didn't hear any explanation how those lanes help Oceanside. Would you like that brought back as a, as a report at our next meeting? No, I'd just like to know what they, what, what Oceanside has in this uh, connection. Well, do you want, that's what I'm asking. You can ask for can I, can I get an answer and if... So the, um, I'll, I'll start and then if, if Alan wants to um, add anything. The, the managed lane connection for 78 and I-5 is part of the study area for the North Coast Corridor CMCP. We didn't go into a lot of the details of what is included. That is also a significant piece that is included in the vision that was presented on the 2021 regional plan on the 14th to the board of directors. I think the, the reason you heard more today about the 15 connection is that that project is further along. And so do you wanna add anything to that, Alan? Just to describe, because those two ends are critical. You know, it's, it's as important what happens on 78 and 15 as what happens on 78 and 5. So we completely agree with you, Deputy Mayor. Timing, you know, we're, we have a number of things sort of on different timelines. And so maybe, Alan, you can talk about that other connection. Thank you. Uh, I'm just echoing what Colleen said. Uh, item 7 did talk about money for the environmental document for 578. I know that's a year or two away to get that uh, effort underway, but that really would close the rest of that figure 8 to the north end, right? It gives that connectivity. Um, and we'll be looking at all the different managed lanes options as a part of that. And we also know that, you know, even the express lane construction to 78, you know, that's where the, the bottlenecks are. And I talk about modeling 
um, the facilities on the on the east end. We do the same thing on along I-5, and we really understand that uh, improvements anywhere in the system Im improve all improve service to everyone. And really, the bottlenecks are on I-5 to the north. So, even though the construction may not be seen in Oceanside, um, Oceanside citizens um, will will benefit significantly from the project. Well, I just you know I I keep seeing that we're uh, unfortunately, uh, the last to get a, a piece of this, and I-5 is a huge connector uh, going east-west uh, off of 76, 78, um, and, and uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to have about, we got 400 feet of bike trail off of the Sprinter, the east-west, uh, uh, bike path on uh, or the tr rail bike um, the rail trail but we we lost we we just we we're going to get uh, you know a, a quarter of a mile of freeway lanes or managed lanes uh, on five and uh, the way it, it it has looked to me so i i just hope we're not losing again All right. Well, I'll ask for it then. Can we get it maybe at, at, at a future meeting in the next month or two, uh, a update on the I-5 and 78 interchange, what, what you have and what you have. Uh, Alan, is that possible? Yes. As I, as I mentioned, we really haven't started work in the environmental document, but we could bring back an item to talk about what we've done in the past and then the alternatives are on that have been looked at in, in the past. Bring you up to speed on where we are. We don't need a huge presentation, but thank you. Address that. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Chair Desmond, can you hear me? This is Matt Tucker. Matt Tucker. Yes, Hello, sir. Hello. So I, I do want to thank uh, Caltrans for working closely with MCTD um, on an integrated corridor concept, specifically as it relates to the Sprinter. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't make the comment that there's a unique opportunity for the region. Right now, the Sprinter operates on 30 minute hitways. Um, the region has advanced the coaster improvements that's going to allow us to go from 22 to 42 trains in 2023. Our five-year plan assumes that we are going to be able to make significant progress towards moving the Sprinter from that 30-minute hitways to 15-minute hitways. The good news is that it will only cost about $200 million to do that without any additional equipment. And I would really encourage both SANDAG and Caltrans to work really closely with NCTD to be able to achieve the goal of implementing those improvements, which are about nine miles of double track, two additional platforms over the next five years and implement those improvements ahead of highway improvements so that people could have a more viable option to avoid taking the automobile in the future. So, Big plug for the Sprinter. We have a wonderful investment that can be built upon, and I'm hoping the region will choose to prioritize it because $200 million within, you know, the cost of a transportation project is, is, is just a bargain for us. So that's my comment. Well, if I known you were going to say that, <laughs> uh, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. But thank you, Matt. Um, okay. Any other uh, comments on this? All right, there's a motion and a second uh, on, on the table. It's the same as seven, trying to make, make the consistency of the language from the R tip to these presentations. Um, so I, I'm asking the same thing for item 10 as, as for item seven on there. Do we have any public uh, comments on this, Tessa? Thank you, Chair. I do not, not see any hands raised for public comments. Okay. Um, can we have a roll call vote? Thank you. On item number 10, San Diego Regional Airport Authority, Joanna Schiavone. Schiavone, yes. City of San Diego, Council Member Monica Montgomery. No. County of San Diego, Chair Jim Desmond. Desmond, yes. East County, Council Member Bill Baber. Yes. Metropolitan Transit System, Mayor Alejandro Sotelo Solis.
Now she may have to text in. Mayor, please go ahead and text your vote to me, Tessa, and I will note it for the record. North County Coastal, Mayor Jewel Edson. Yes. North County Enland, Mayor Paul McNamara. McNamara, yes. North County Transit District, Deputy Mayor Jack Feller. Yes. Port of San Diego, Commissioner Gary Benelli. Benelli voting yes on the assumption that this language is also coming back to the Transportation Committee. Yes, that's um, what I intend. Thank you. Um, South County, Vice Chair Bill Sandkey. Sandkey, yes. And for the record, um, MTS Mayor Alejandro Sotelo Solis has texted her vote as no. Okay. Um, that motion passes. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, next item is continued public comments. Do we have any other uh, members of the public that want to speak on items not on the agenda today? Tessa? I do not see any further hands, hands raised, Chair. How about any committee members? Do you have any further comments? I just want to say thank you very much to the staff for bringing this information forward. I know it's a lot of work and a lot of effort with the RTIP and everything else, and there was a lot in there today. And so I appreciate uh, all the staff and everything they've done and answering all the questions and uh, bringing these items forward. It was a very good meeting, very informative. Um, our next meeting is uh, scheduled for Friday, September 18th at 9 a.m. We'll see you there. This meeting's adjourned. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.